They seem to remove immediately all uh, defense uh, disc discretionary uh, spending. And that means that defense is off the table and uh, non-discretionary materials are only uh, off the table as well. So that kind of limits where the budget cuts could come. And Congressman Frank, I've heard many times uh, talk about this issue. And uh, uh, so I'm very anxious to hear what he has to say. But now it's my pleasure to introduce to you the Vice President uh, at BCC, uh, Joan Menard, who will introduce uh, Congressman Frank. Joan Menard. Thank you. Today it's my privilege to welcome my friend, Congressman Barney Fran, to the Fall River campus of Bristol Community College. And by the way, it's the fastest growing community college in Massachusetts. So, yeah. When I thought about introducing Barney, I thought I would use a quote that someone else had to use to describe him. And here's, here's a quote that I think fits him best. Not only does Congressman Frank care deeply about helping us, his constituents, but he's a brilliant advocate for all working men and women of the Commonwealth. He has contributed more to our national economic and financial stability and recovery than any other member of Congress. Barney, we're so proud of you. We're so happy you could be here and visit us to see what we do here at Bristol Community College every day to ensure a prosperous and rewarding future for the people of Southeastern Massachusetts. So, fine. Thank you for being here. Thank you. I always enjoy speaking here and to have my former colleague, Joan and I were in the legislature together uh, years ago, and uh, I've enjoyed working with her ever since. I also want to say, um, I'm glad to be able to repeat here something I say elsewhere, namely that community colleges are as important as any other institution or entity in this country for our economy. I have been concerned for some time with the increased inequality in America in which the rich get richer and richer and people who work hard don't get rewarded and the incomes for people in the categories who work every day, uh, five days a week, that they haven't gone up. And I asked two men about that, Alan Greenspan and Ben Bernanke, two Republican appointees to be head of the Federal Reserve, itself a conservative institution. And independently, both of them said to me, look, the answer in the longer run is education, namely to get job skills that are appropriate to the current economy to people who uh, are in those economic categories and both of them said and the single most important way to do that is through community colleges. Community colleges are our major method of getting job skills to people and as many of you know because you're studying them these are the kind of jobs that don't go offshore. Uh, I use nursing as an example. I remember talking to Jack Sprager who does a great job as president a couple years ago about the nursing situation and he mentioned um, how few slots he had for young people who want to become nurses, or not so young people, because community colleges do a great job of making clear that education doesn't have to stop when you, uh, when you hit your early 20s. And he said the problem was he had only something like 40 some odd slots. Now I know we have a terrible need for nurses in our hospitals and elsewhere, and we have a lot of young people who could be nurses, and there's one very good thing about nursing. You can't stick a needle in somebody from Mumbai. If we teach people to be nurses, these are jobs that are staying here in the United States. We don't have to worry about them being outsourced. That's true about a lot of other things in terms of food service, in terms of uh, uh, maintenance and repair of important equipment, a lot of jobs that are very important for the quality of our lives. And the problem has been that we've been cutting back on community college funding because community colleges have historically been funded by the state. And the state gets squeezed because the federal government squeezed it. And as Jack said, we had this view for a while that you couldn't cut military spending. And that is a terrible mistake. We are suffering here from the phenomenon known as cultural lag, where opinion remains after the facts that justified the opinion have disappeared. <clears throat> 
for most of American history, until 1941, we didn't pay a lot of attention to the rest of the world. We didn't have to. We were strong, we were protected by the oceans, etc. Then came Hitler and his allies in Japan and Italy. And they were a threat to our very existence. So we fought back, and we fought back successfully. Great loss. And then, just when people thought we could relax, communism appeared as a very threatening activity. It was there before. But under Stalin, the Soviet Union became an even greater threat to us than Hitler was in terms of our ability to survive. <clears throat> so from 1940 to 1990, we, were, uh, we, had our, we had our fists up. We were ready to fight evil people who could have destroyed us. And that, understandably, became the number one priority. We got some good results in the early 90s for a variety of reasons. The Soviet Union collapsed. It's been succeeded by a country, Russia, that's not run in the best way in the world, as I've said from time to time. As I look at what goes on in Russia today, I'm very happy my grandparents got the hell out of there. I have no desire to go back. Um, and the feeling appears to be mutual. But they're not a threat to the United States. They were a threat to the little country of Georgia. They're not a threat to Europe. For the first time, beginning in the early 90s, we could relax. We do not face a threat to our existence. And we began to reduce military spending under Bill Clinton. Then came the terrible murders of 2001. And those were awful mass murders of innocent people. But they shouldn't be equated with either the Nazis or the communists. The terrorists are terrible people who want to kill Americans. But they do not have the capacity to threaten our very existence. Yes, we need to fight them. But you fight them differently and, frankly, less expensively. We had nuclear submarines to fight the Soviet Union. Now, I wish you could use nuclear submarines to defeat the terrorists, because they don't have any, and we got more than anybody in the world. So if nuclear submarines beat terrorists, we'd have it. It's a tougher issue in some ways, but again, less threatening. Yes, they, they threaten people, but not our very existence. It doesn't cost as much to do this, and we continue to spend money as if we were not only defending ourselves, but the whole world. And that's the other difference. First of all, there is no more communist threat. Secondly, nations that we originally had to protect ought to be able to take care of themselves. One of the great accomplishments of history was President Harry Truman, who created NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, in 1949. And he did it because the countries of Europe, both our former allies and our former enemies, were very weak and very poor. They had just gone through World War II. None of them were really able to defend themselves. And on the other end of Europe, you had Stalin, a vicious dictator who had a poor country that he was running, but he ran it so brutally that whatever they did have, he put into the military. So they were a strong military power. And you had this strong, threatening military power moving west, taking over Czechoslovakia, taking over other countries. And you have the countries of Western Europe unable to defend themselves. So Harry Truman very bravely and correctly stepped in and America protected Central and Western Europe from the communists. And we did it with our money and our troops and our tax dollars. Now 61 years later, there were three elements, remember. A weak Europe, a strong and threatening communist regime, and American protection of the weak Europe. Europe's no longer weak. Those countries, both our former enemies and our former allies, are prosperous. They're as strong as you can be. They have great economies. They are capable of defending themselves militarily. On the other hand, there's no more communist threat. It's Russia, but it's not expansionist. So Europe isn't weak, and they're not being threatened. One thing in that equation hasn't changed. We're still there defending them. We're spending as much money proportionally almost as, as we were 60 years ago. The threat has gone away. That's the cultural egg. We're still there. We had to confront the Soviet Union. We were ready to fight a war against the Soviet Union. It would have been a terrible thing, but we had to be ready to do it. We had three ways of dropping nuclear weapons on the Soviet Union. Intercontinental ballistic missiles, strategic air command, and nuclear submarines. The Soviet Union collapsed. Russia had some nuclear weapons. We're not nearly in the kind of pose that we were before. But I want to be conservative. We had three ways 
to fight a thermonuclear war of the Soviet Union. I want to say to the Pentagon, pick two. I'm not declaring total victory yet. Keep two of those. Give up one. If they gave up one, we'd save $10 billion a year or more. We could save a lot more money. The president just announced for reasons I don't understand. He wants to keep three more brigades, wants to keep three brigades that George Bush wanted to bring home in Europe. Thousands of people in Europe. More money and money spent elsewhere. I was especially upset to read that Secretary Gates, our Secretary of Defense, good guy, is trying to find a way to keep American troops in Iraq after the end of this year. Now George Bush said we would get the troops out. The bad guys Saddam's gone, there are still some problems in Iraq. They don't seem, many Iraqis don't like each other. And I'm sorry they don't like each other. And I'm especially sorry that the people who don't like each other sometimes shoot each other. But why is that worth billions of dollars of your tax money, especially since we can't solve the problem? You know, I said, when we do go into some of these countries, we're like the police officer, and you talk to police officers, some of you may be police officers, is what I'm told by them, that one of the worst things that could happen to a police officer is to be called to get into a domestic dispute, where the husband and the wife are fighting, or the two people, the two lovers are fighting. And half the time, the cop becomes, they, they, they get together and go after the cop. Uh, it, it's a very difficult situation to be injected into one of those internal civil situations. And we keep doing it. Uh, but here's the issue. So I just happened to be reading this book by Fareed Zakaria, who's a very thoughtful guy, he's on television and writes in Newsweek about foreign policy. And this one struck me. He's talking about, thank you, the post-American world. And what he says is, a hundred years ago we had a multipolar world, multipolar, US, Britain, France, Germany, Russia, etc., Japan. Then came the bipolar duopoly of the Cold War, the United States and Soviet Union, two powers. <coughs> then, since 1991, we have lived under an American imperium, a unique unipolar world in which the open global economy has expanded and accelerated dramatically. So we're now talking about, he says, a unipolar, but here's the nature of this unipolar world. At the political military level, we remain in a single superpower world, us, with the military superpower. In every other dimension, industrial, financial, educational, social, cultural, the distribution of power is shifting, moving away from American dominance. Now those are all the things that enhance the quality of life. So when it comes to education and culture and industry, etc., the rest of the world is blooming. The only place where we are still the dominant one is military. Why? Because the most popular book in Europe I think in Japan and elsewhere, is Tom Sawyer. Particularly the part where Tom Sawyer gets everybody to paint his fence and they think he's doing them a big favor. We are painting the world's fence. We're the big political military power. So we get to spend all of your money on the military, they get to not spend on the military, and instead they flourish educationally, culturally, economically, etc. Now I want us to be the strongest nation in the world. That's not an issue. The question is, how much more than everybody else put together do we have to be strong? That is, we think we have a margin of error. I am glad that the United States Air Force is the strongest Air Force in the world. But do people here know what's the second strongest Air Force in the world? Anybody want to guess? It's the Navy. The United States Navy is the second strongest Air Force in the world. Now I want us to be number one. But I don't think we have to be number one and number two. I don't think that, that, and by the way, you go throughout that way. I think we ought to be pulling out of Iraq. Iraq and Afghanistan together are costing us $150 billion a year. That's about 13, 12 and a half billion dollars a month. To give you some comparison, talk to Will Flanagan, who's very upset, as he should be, because the Community Development Block Grant Program nationally is being cut back. Fall River uses the Community Development Block Grant Program very well. So does New Bedford. Joan knows well what we've been able to do with it. Actually, Fall River uses it better than anybody, because going back to Carlton Viveros, we got permission, he asked for it, for Fall River to have more flexibility in Community Development Block Grants. The whole Community Development Block Grant Program for the country, and the budget cutters are gonna cut it back which is going to cut back services in Fall River. The whole program for the whole country costs $5 billion a year. 
Iraq and Afghanistan cost twelve and a half billion dollars a month. That's the disproportions we're talking about. I believe the time has come for us to say, yeah, we're going to defend ourselves, and there are allies that we have to worry about. Uh, I don't want to see Israel overtaken. I don't want the communist Chinese to undo uh, the freedom and independence of Taiwan. But I don't understand why we are protecting Western Europe. I don't understand why we maintain the same nuclear capacity we had before. And I don't understand why America has to be the worldwide first responder. Take Libya. Now, Libya is run by a murderous thug who was killing his own people. I was glad to see the rest of the world say we're not going to let that happen. But why did America have to take the lead? Look at the map. We're 3,500 or 3,600 miles from Libya. France and Italy could spit and hit Libya with the wind at their backs. Spain, they're right across the Mediterranean Sea. England's not that much further away. Germany's much closer. They're all very well developed. Take all those European countries together. They are bigger than America. They have a bigger economy, a bigger population. But America's got to be the one to do the military work. Why? Because we've let the rest of the world get dependent on us. And I want to stress again, I'm not talking about ignoring the rest of the world. I wish we were doing more to help poor children. And we could do that. I wish we were doing more to combat malaria and AIDS and other diseases throughout the world and helping people economically. We could cut the extra military spending and with a very small percentage of that do more to fight hunger and to help educate people in the rest of the world. So it is a great mistake, it's, as this book says. The only place in which we are still the dominant power in the world of leaving everybody in the dust is in the military. And why? Because they're very happy to let us do that. We have thousands of Marines on the island of Okinawa, left over from World War II. They serve no purpose. Yes, we've got to worry about China. We have sea and air power there, and that's a good thing. Nobody thinks the Marines are going to land on the mainland of China and confront 15,000 Marines, the three million member Chinese army. Uh, place after place. Now, there's also inefficiency. We could, we could improve our efficiency. But that won't bring us enough. I believe you could easily cut, first of all, if we, end, if we pulled out of Afghanistan and Iraq within a few months, that's $150 billion a year. An enormous amount of money in terms of the federal budget. Then you cut back other things. So from the current spending, we could cut more than $200 billion a year from the military. It's over $700 billion, And not be any less safe. In fact, we could be even more safe. Take a small percentage of that and put it more into homeland security. Put it more into protecting places. And more into police. In fact, I, even with terrorism, we have people who live in our cities who are more likely, frankly, to be in danger because of inadequate police and fire services than from terrorism. I remember, was it what, uh, in October of last year, Mayor, when you had that terrible fire, and you pointed out, fortunately, we'd been able last year to get some money back into the fire service, and we averted a great disaster in the city. Um, I'm sad to say that we're not in a position to do that anymore, or we won't be a year from now. If we continue to spend money on uh, infrastructure in Afghanistan and security forces in Iraq and defending Germany against the Soviet Union, and my favorite, we are building an anti-missile defense system for the Czech Republic, Poland, and Bulgaria against Iran. Makes no sense. Um, we don't have enough money for police and firefighters here. We don't have enough money for commuter rail. We don't have enough money to expand this institution so more people can get the kind of jobs that will pay them well and will stay the work here in America. Um, so that's really where we are. I believe we would not lose anything in terms of safety if we said to the rest of the world, it couldn't happen overnight, but the next time there's Olivia, two years from now, it shouldn't have to be America. We shouldn't be the only ones that have the capacity to do that, particularly where it's near them. You know, if the problem was in Mexico, I'd say, okay, that's America's job. But if it's in Libya, I don't understand why it's not Europe's job. And you go area after area, and we would begin, the president is talking about now, trying to get the Iraqis, George Bush promised to get out of Iraq at the end of this year. We're now going to ask you, it's a big political issue because most of the Iraqis don't want us there and we're trying to persuade the Iraqis to let us stay there <coughs> at a cost of, uh, of billions, more of the money of the 12 and a half billion is from Afghanistan, but a significant amount comes from Iraq. And even in Afghanistan, they, they said, well, we're there now because, and I voted to go to Afghanistan because they let Osama bin Laden 
use that place to murder people. By the way, not just Americans. Before he murdered Americans, he murdered hundreds of innocent Africans in, in Kenya and Tanzania because he was mad in America. He went to blow up the American embassies and he killed hundreds of innocent Africans. Even by his own crazy logic, that's totally, there's no basis for that. But we're told we have to be in Afghanistan now to keep the terrorists from having a base. Well, but if it's not Afghanistan, it will be Yemen. If it's not Yemen, it will be Somalia or Sudan or one other place. The problem with that argument is, if you say it's our self-defense need to prevent the terrorists from having any place in the world where they can conspire together, then we are literally policing the whole world. We could literally have to run every country in the world. I would rather bring a lot of those money home and then spend a fairly small percentage of it shoring up our defenses here, and we would be better off. With that, I, and, and by the way, you now see what happens. If we don't do that, Pell Grants will get cut. And money in the state will get cut, so money for BCC and UMass Dartmouth will get cut in addition. And we will not get commuter rail. And we won't get the highway improvements we need. And we won't get CDBG funds to do the kind of improvements we need. And we'll lose on police, and we'll lose on fire, and we'll lose in education. Uh, you, you will not see the environmental cleanups. New Bedford Harbor will continue to be a 40-year deal instead of a 10-year deal, which it could be, in terms of, uh, of, of, of cleaning it up. And then every, everything that we do to improve the quality of our own lives is sacrificed because we are uh, the world's leading super, we are the only superpower in the world militarily, and it is not an accident that we are the leading superpower militarily, but no longer in education or cultural activity, et cetera, et cetera, because there's a trade-off there. And the more you spend in one area, the less you have to spend elsewhere. So yeah, we should be reducing the deficit. The question is how we do it. Now, at that, this point, I'd be glad to uh, throw it open and respond. Yes? Congressman Frank, my name is Julian, and I have a question. It's um, not really to do with the military, but it's a health care question. My son and I both go to BCC. My son only works two days a week, and he did have BMC Health Net plan for a while. They sent him a letter and said that because he worked and because he was going to school, they could no longer um, give him insurance. He could pick it up at the school. Who said this? This is um, BMC Health Net plan the, through Mass Health and all that. Well, the problem is with that is he, he also gets a Pell Grant. Well, now the 800 and some odd dollars that he has to pay for insurance comes out of his Pell Grant. And now he's left with only working a couple of days a week to go out and have to pay whatever isn't paid. And he has to also buy his books. And to me, that just doesn't... No, I agree with that. It's two things. First of all... There's a squeeze on everybody because so much of the money goes into the military. And what they're trying to do is cut back. The two big areas to cut back are medical care and the military. Those are the two. And the more you cut back, the, the, the more you insulate the military, the more you put a squeeze elsewhere. As to the specifics, as you know, Massachusetts got into the health care business before the federal government. And so the specifics I'm not as familiar with because that's the state plan. It's the plan that Governor Romney signed, although um, he actually needs medical treatment for a severe case of amnesia because he forgot that he, he, and, he and Menard put together health care before it got to us in Washington and uh, he's leaving it all to her. He's letting her have all the credit. But um, uh, I, I, if you want to check with my office later, I can look into the specifics. But in general, because it's, that's largely, that's why I asked, it's a state issue. I, I'm not as familiar with it. Congressman, uh, in, in President Eisenhower's last speech to the American people in 1960, he warned. Right, everybody here who remembers that, raise your hand. <laughs> he warned about the military industrial complex and that he thought that that was one of the biggest dangers yep. that faced the country. <clears throat> and this coming from someone who was the commander of the Allied forces during World War II and the commander in chief, obviously, of the President of the United States from 1952 to 1960. That speech was changed a bit because originally it was it was intended, he intended to say, the military industrial congressional uh, complex. So I'm, I'm curious and skeptical, quite honestly, about how much of a chance, given, given a lot of uh, particulars, one of which is that uh, co corporations cannot contribute all the money that they want, political campaigns, 
And we know that a lot of congression, uh, congressional districts have uh, military installations and Boeing type places. Uh, so what really is the Well, two things. First of all, first of all, I agree it's hard. Um, and I would say this, I'd make a recommendation that I think the BCC understands. Don't invite any politician to come here and tell you what's easy, because you don't need us to tell you what's easy. If it's easy, we can do it. It's hard, I understand that, and I'm making a major effort here. But I'm somewhat optimistic for two reasons. The first one is that people now understand the trade-off. If it's a question about cutting the military or not, then people say, well, it's not bad, why do it? But if it's a question of cutting the military or cutting off Medicare, cutting the military or reducing Pell Grants, cutting the military or not having enough cops and firefighters on the streets, then the argument shifts a little bit. You know, there's a great line, there's a great comedian of the Eisenhower era that you'll remember, a lot of people won't, his name was Henny Youngman. He was the king of the one-liners. Um, his most famous, this was back in the days when all the comedians used to make fun of their wives and mothers-in-law. His most famous, they said the shortest joke in history was, take my wife. Please. Um, but a better one, one that really I find I use in politics. How's your wife compared to what? And that's, the, that's what I'm always doing, compared to what? If you don't compare it to something, then you don't get the full argument. But secondly, I'm also not talking just about that. I agree we should be cutting back on the industrial complex. But part of what people don't focus on is the troops in Europe. Europe's not in anybody's district. Pulling the Marines out of Japan is in the districts of the people in Japan who want them out of there. Iraq isn't anybody's district. In other words, I understand that, and I'm fighting that, trying to cut back on some weapon systems. But there's a lot that we do that people haven't looked at that doesn't even get covered by that argument. Because we are spending a great deal overseas. The money in Afghanistan and Iraq does very little. There are a few American contractors there, but most of it, when we send a billion two, there was a motion to cut a billion two out of the budget that went to Iraqi security forces and it lost. That doesn't help anybody in America. So those are the two things. We still have a tough fight here. But one, we have the trade-off. And two, and we just didn't win one. I would point this out. We had this fight over the second engine for a fighter plane. And it's made here in Massachusetts if they had the second engine GE. And I want, the first time I came up, I had to vote for it because there were some guys on the committee I chair and I needed to have to vote for financial reform. This time they were gone, I voted against it, even though I represent Massachusetts where it's being made. We, we defeated, the Congress was insisting on keeping billions in play for a second engine. We won that fight this year. We're beginning to win some fights, even on those industrial ones. But even though I agree with you that those will be the last ones we'll get, there's a lot of money we can save that we're spending overseas involved in fights where we only make everybody mad that won't, that, that's not interfered with by that. Hi, um, Congressman. My brother is a young at the age where he's starting to get veteran services. And I know it's got the big Americans and a lot of people I know more so now than ever happy and proud to be helping out the veterans and military. How do we um, cut funding in America taking that. Well, veterans are separate. The budget I talked about, the 700 billion, has nothing to do with the veterans. Not just veterans, but I think all, they kind of now look at military as more important than it was. And well, they, well they, and I think we have to point out, in fact, the opposite is the case. The military was very important to us from 1940 to 1990 because we faced first Hitler and Stalin, and we had military enemies. We, I, nobody is contemplating that I know of America not being the strongest nation in the world. As I said, everybody wants the Air Force to be the strongest Air Force. We just don't think the Navy has to be the second strongest. They think it'd be tied for third. I still feel pretty secure. I mean, so, but we're, we're, not, we're not talking about the veterans. And by the way, when you look at the cost of the wars, the cost of the wars is not just the money now, but it is the injured veterans who are, have an absolute claim on us. So, and that's been particularly the case now, by the way, Veterans costs are going up, in some ways for good reason. Medical care, battlefield medical care is much better. People are surviving wounds now that would have killed them even 15 and 20 years ago, and certainly before that. My, my, my mother had a brother who was killed in World War II, and he was shot and he came home and he, a couple months later he died here in the U.S. from the wounds. That wouldn't have happened today. That was, in, you know, in 43. Um, 
But that means more money for the future. We have this terrible problem in Afghanistan with these uh, improvised explosive devices. So uh, guys are losing limbs. And God knows you're going to spend every possible penny you can. You can never make up for it, but you can do everything you can to try and alleviate that terrible problem. So, but so the answer is, I'm not talking about cutting a penny out of veterans. Uh, I'm, I am saying we don't need the military as much. And in terms of jobs, we're not talking about anybody now in the military losing his or her job. But the military, remember the average enlistment, the average time is six to seven years. Over, if you just don't renew it at the same level, you can reduce the uh, total number there. And put that money, and it's true, military spending will create jobs. We can, but it's not the most efficient way to do it. Uh, I would rather put that money into highway construction and uh, you know, street work and hiring police officers and firefighters. Hey, take an ex-military person and give them a job in one of the uniformed services in the city. Great trade off. How about teaching? How about getting some young military guys who might want to go in to teach, which would be a good thing. So there's plenty you can do with that. Yes? Frank, how would cutting military spending affect the Americans that create um, military devices here as a source of employment? Um, 15,000 Marines in Okinawa have nothing to do with that. that again, I, I want, that goes back to that point there. Much of what we are doing is simply standing guard for other countries so they don't have to do it themselves. We would keep our technology. There's no question, and technology is important. Um, but I'm not talking about cutting back. I am cutting back on the excess. I really need two engines for that plane. But primarily it would be in the uh, extent to which we have got manpower overseas. Ending the war in Afghanistan and Iraq, bringing our troops home from Iraq and Afghanistan would have zero effect on that. I'm very proud of that, by the way, have, because if we do send, the answer is we are still going to have to send people over sometime, and they should be very well equipped. Um, I have several times now toured not far from here, there's a general dynamics plant in the Taunton Industrial Park that does excellent work in doing things for the people on the battlefield. The uh, Win T program, and I, I'm all for it. Irvin Russell, who worked for me, uh, was a Vietnam veteran, in-country Vietnam veteran, and he's been with me, and he's amazed at you know, the difference. I mean, we've decided, the difference between the kind of weaponry that they got today and what he had is as great as well between what he had in the Civil War. So we're not talking about cutting that back. We won't need as much of it. And, uh, but primarily what we're talking about are people overseas. Now again, I asked Alan Greenspan, people say, you know, the military does produce jobs. He said, of course, you know, just digging a hole will produce a job. But if you look at the various ways that society can use money, military spending is less likely to be productive than any other. You type a couple more, yeah. I, uh I have a few questions on <coughs> social. I well, want to do one because I got a, a, I'm going to rush. On social security, yeah. Because uh, they are talking of possibly cutting social security, which is not contributing. All right, let me cut to it. I agree with you. Social security, by the way. Um, Social Security, if Social Security is credited with all the money paid in and the interest on that money, uh, it doesn't begin to cost any money until about 2039. Um, uh, well, if you notice, by the way, even the Republican budget cutter, Paul Ryan, has backed away from cutting Social Security. So that, 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 that point appears to have been made. Then they talk about raising the retirement. Okay, age. nobody's talking about it now. I understand that. I'm trying to. I don't mean to be rude, but we're going to have a lot of questions. They backed off that, and I, I at least I campaign hard against that. You know, raising retirement age if you sit in a desk is one thing. Uh, if you've been, uh, well, you know, you're out on the fishing fleet in New Bedford, I think raising retirement age is a great mistake. I, I don't think you're going to see that happening. I think, and I certainly would fight it. You can raise the base on which Social Security taxes are, are levied. But they seem to have backed away, because you're right, Social Security has not been the problem. They're talking more about Medicare. Let me move on to some other questions. Yeah. Um, how much of the military is being used to defend oil in the Persian Gulf? Um, not a whole lot. I honestly believe that that's, because some of the people argue that, well, that's why we went to Libya. Um, in fact, going into Iraq made the situation worse with regard to oil rather than better. And the point is that the people in the Persian, there'll be some, I mean, we will, again, we'll still be the strongest military nation in the world. 
But the people who produce the oil want to sell it to us. It's not like we have to go in and, and rescue the oil militarily. What the hell else are they going to do with it? These tend to be small countries uh, uh, that, that want to sell us the oil. So some part of it is there, but I think it's a much smaller part than usual, and it certainly was not a justification in my judgment for going to Iraq. Um, it made the oil situation worse rather than better, similarly with Libya. Uh, there's less oil coming out of Libya now after the military intervention than before. But the main thing is, look, these people got oil and they want to sell it to us. And by the way, while we're on the energy thing, I, people might want to know, since we're not far from there, that America is now beginning to export, what would we going to export in the energy field? Liquefied natural gas. The notion of building a big tank to import liquefied natural gas not only is environmentally wrong and public safety wrong, it now makes absolutely no economic sense because we have a surplus of that stuff here. All the more reason why we're going to get rid of the head Thank you. Um, the mayor's going to just talk for a minute. And... Yeah, let me, I am glad to do that. Um, one of the most important parts of the job of a member of Congress is to work with local officials, and one of the problems you have sometimes is people tend to point the finger. I am very proud of our working relationship. I have been working closely with Will Flanagan since he became mayor. We have collaborated on a number of very important projects, and we want to keep doing it. And when I go and fight for federal funding, one of the things that makes me confident is I can say, look, I represent some places where it's well spent. And, and, and that is certainly true of Fall River. I have no, I never have to apologize for fighting for money because I know that under Mayor Flanagan it's being spent for the benefit of the people of the city. Thank, Thank you, you, Congressman. It's an honor uh, to always come back here to Bristol Community College and I see President Sprager here also. Uh, you doing some great things over here at this college and uh, I'm very proud uh, as mayor of the city to have BCC in our jurisdiction. And it's always great to have Congressman Frank here with us because he and I work on a number of issues affecting the city, whether it's education or public safety or making sure that when our veterans return home, they have access to uh, health care, and they have access to housing, and they have access to job training. And that's very important because when it becomes even more difficult uh, to achieve a job in today's economy, it's important to ensure that we have the workforce training grants uh, being made available so when we have those employees entering or in the workforce, they're getting the training they need to stay competitive. Uh, but the one thing I want to stress upon you all here uh, this afternoon uh, is the importance of your vote. And we have some great volunteers here today for the Coalition for Social Justice who are going to be doing a voter drive. So those of you who are not registered to vote, I strongly encourage you to register. Uh, I know the surrounding towns will be having their elections and will be having municipal elections here in September and in November of this year. And your vote counts. Uh, it counts on every issue you can think of. So uh, I strongly encourage you to vote. They'll be going around with clipboards, uh, doing their best to help to register you and ask questions of them. And stay involved. Ask questions of me, ask questions of your congressman, because that's what's important. When we're making decisions, uh, we need to know what's on your mind because it's your will that we're carrying out when we make initiatives and go forward. So by keeping us informed and helping us keep our finger on the pulses of the community, we stay better informed in our decision making. So Congressman, I just want to thank you for being supportive of our district, fighting for us down in Washington, D.C. I know you have a battle on your hands each and every day, and uh, the more money you get for our district, be sure that I'm going to spend it and spend it wisely. So thank you all for allowing me to speak, and please register the vote.